Maxwell Fortin is currently a PhD student in anthropology at Binghamton University. He received his BA in anthropology from Michigan State University in 2015 and his MA in anthropology from Binghamton University at 2017. Maxwell is studying the relationship between landscapes and rock imagery in the Chaco world. Since 2016, Max has worked at Petrified Forest National Park, Navajo, Mo Navajo National Monument, multiple CRM firms, and as survey director for the Archaeology Southwest's Upper Gila Preservation Archaeology Field School. He currently lives in Tucson, Arizona, and is working part-time at the Coronado National Forest while he writes his dissertation. At the 2018 Pecos Conference, he won the Cordell Prize for his research into shield depictions at Pueblo Three cliff dwellings in Sagi Canyon, Canyon. And since July, Max has supported Ark and Hiss as co-vice president for activities, and many of you have met him on Ark and Hiss field trips. It has been my pleasure to work with Maxwell these months in planning and carrying out activities for Ark and Hiss. So with that, I'll turn it over to Max. Thanks. Then, um kind of two studies I've been conducting at uh, Petrified Forest over the years, um, specifically looking at uh, salient places on the Petrified Forest landscape, places that uh, don't aren't quite as easily defined as um, clear just domestic spaces, spaces of everyday life, but seem to have uh, something more complicated going on. Um, specifically, um, these two locations are located on two little hills in Petrified Forest in different areas of the park, one being the Max uh, Great House site, which is um, up at the top there, and then the other being the uh, Lacey Point Butte site there on the bottom. Um, so yeah, these are two different uh, places on the landscape which uh, seem to um, embody uh, spaces that are being used for either ceremony or pilgrimage, something more than just um, a standard habitation site, but um, seem to embody uh, two different um, ideologies. Petrified Forest is a very diverse cultural landscape, um, which I'll talk about more in a second. But uh, these two spaces, as similar as they are, they also seem to be representing two different um, belief systems or ideologies, one enmeshed more in local traditions and one being possibly uh, an outside tradition that uh, trying to take root um, so it's just very interesting seeing uh, these two different spaces that, um, while in the same landscape, are representing um, seeming very different ideologies and different practices um, that people were uh, doing um, to uh, represent these uh, beliefs. Um, if you haven't been there, Petrified Forest National Park is located a um, couple hours uh, east of Flagstaff. Um, it's beautiful. It was established in uh, 1906 as a national monument to uh, protect the um, de uh, intense uh, uh, petrified uh, wood deposits there dating from the late Triassic. Uh, in 1962, the park was ex um, actually became a national park and uh, the park was expanded to include the uh, Painted Desert as well, which is in the uh, north um, portion of the park. Um, it's beautiful. Uh, if you haven't been, please go. Um, but in addition to being a paleontological park, uh, Petrified Forest has an incredible uh, human history um, as well. Uh, we have very, everything from Paleo-Indian sites, uh, Clovis sites, all the way up to Route 66. Um, whoops, I don't know why uh, my slides are jumping ahead of me. But um, yeah, fun fact, uh, Petrified Forest National Park is... Uh, the only uh, national park in the country that preserves an original segment of Route 66. Um, so yeah, there's an incredible uh, human history um, in, at Petrified Forest, but um, we'll be specifically talking today about the ancestral Pueblo um, occupation period of the park, uh, specifically mainly uh, the Pueblo II, Pueblo III. We're, so we're talking about 8900s through the 1200s uh, roughly. And uh, specifically, well, our first site, um, the Lacey Point site. Um, Lacey Point, it's located kind of in a transitional zone in the Peña Desert um, between the Mesa top overlooking the Peña Desert and the Lithodendron uh, wash the valley floor below. Um, it occupies this little conical butte there, which you can see on the left, which has uh, pretty restricted access 
there's only kind of one way into the site, uh, kind of over this little land bridge. All the other sides are these really steep boulder talus slopes. Um, but I have climbed them before the other ways of the site, but I wouldn't recommend it. Um, so it's really just pretty one way in, one way out um, to the site. Um, up on top of the little butte there, um, it's only now 10 by five meters, uh, pretty small space, but there are is the remains of a small structure up top. Um, we think it's a little hall structure. Um, there are some upright slabs and uh, some burnt daub that we found um, on the slope. So it's a pretty small innocuous structure, um, not much left of it, but we think it's uh, would have been maybe two to three rooms. Not very visually impressive, but um, that stands in contrast to the rest of the site, which has a very uh, interesting concentration of petroglyphs on the boulders below. Uh, which is then one of the main draws uh, to the site by researchers and an incredible um, artifact scatter um, or artifact uh, assemblage, uh, really high concentration of ceramic sherds, lithic debitage, other artifacts, which stands in contrast to the seemingly small innocuous structure up top. Um, so these are some of the things that uh, researchers have uh, noticed about the site. The site's been reported on since the 1980s. And since then, people of uh, archaeologists have mostly focused on the site's petroglyphs and noted the contrast between uh, this tiny little field house sized structure and a seemingly uh, innocuously huge uh, artifact scatter. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about some of the rock art before I get into um, the study I conducted. Um, there's about 28 panels um, on the site. This is the most prominent one, the one that's uh, talked about most. Um, it's on a pretty prominent boulder um, below the uh, uh, top of the butte. And uh, yeah, it's very visible, very prominent, and uh, definitely has uh, kind of two dueling or two kind of, kind of main themes that seem to be uh, working uh, together on it, that being hunting and fertility. Um, hunting, you can see there's a, see if I can get my, yep, cursor, bow and arrow, just game animals, and then fertility, um, have, uh, this female figure here, uh, flute player, which has been connected, um, ethnographically by some groups, uh, to fertility. And then these feet, which, uh, have, as you'll see, these, uh, rather long phallic looking toes. Um, so kind of, there's, uh, two themes here of, uh, hunting and fertility. And uh, ethnographically, um, previous archeologists have uh, ethnographically linked this site to um, a figure in the uh, Hopi and other uh, Puebloan traditions of a figure called the mother of game. Um, I, I Forgive me for butchering this. The Hopi pronunciation is Tuwa Bantam. Um, I'm sure I butchered that and I'm so sorry. But um, yeah, this figure is a, uh, prominent in um, Hopi traditions. She's said to have lived in the little Colorado River Valley and be a figure that uh, is responsible for the propagation the, um, and the population of game animals and that hunters who wanted to have a successful hunt would uh, bring uh, make offerings to her. And we believe um, this figure, um, this figure with uh, the two twin discs, the raised hands in association with this imagery is probably a representation of some iteration of this mother of game figure. Um, and this composition is found throughout the larger petrified forest region. Um, so this figure is, this is not standalone. Uh, this, she is found in other areas of uh, the petrified forest larger region. Um, yeah, so this is the main panel at the site and uh, multiple uh, archeologists have written on this panel in the past. Um, there are other rock art on the site. Um, most of it, though, is not as prominent as the Mother of Game panel. Um, it's tucked away in these little boulder crevices that uh, can barely fit one person. Um, there was some speculation um, that maybe the, this big spiral could have been a solstice marker, but uh, there doesn't seem to be um, any alignments. Again, uh, I haven't been there on the solstice to check it out, but it um, doesn't seem to be... Uh, uh, previous people I've looked at and uh, doesn't seem to have been the solstice marker. But uh, yeah, none of the other panels have quite as strong a 
theme or composition, and they all kind of tend to be tucked away in these little uh, nooks. Um, so yeah, lots of uh, previous archaeologists have talked about lacy points, petroglyphs, um, and noted uh, uh, the small structure on top of uh, the butte and the large artifact scatter. But um, I wanted to focus more in on uh, the uh, the site's artifact assemblage and really see. You know, everyone talks about you know, oh, lacy point. That's that tiny little structure and this huge artifact assemblage. That's, it's really where it's like well. Rather than uh, just kind of talk like talk about what's get actually some dates to show that or maybe show it not. So I wanted to compare Lacey Point's artifact assemblage to other different types of sites in the surrounding region to see how is Lacey Point figure into um, these other sites. What is it most similar to, or is it not similar to any other type of site? What type of box does it fit in most, or does it not fit into any box of uh, different types of sites. People have talked about Lacey Point being a shrine, but does the artifact assemblage um, bear that out? Or does it tend to look more like a domestic uh, site or a field house site? So I chose uh, three other um, sites in the area. Um, one, 575 is a large Pueblo room block, so very much a domestic site. It's located in a similar setting to Lacey Point on a little butte overlooking the Painted Desert. Uh, down in the Painted Desert. Uh, another is a uh, 551, it's more of a field house site. So not a similar setting to Lacey Point because it's located up on this mesa top um, away from the Painted Desert Rim, um, but uh, similar architecture to what you see at Lacey Point, kind of a small field house size structure. And then 608, which is similar to the field house and that's away from the Painted Desert Rim, not in a location like um, uh, Lacey Point, but um, and also uh, has architecture that is not like Lacey Point. So it really is the one that doesn't look like Lacey Point at all. So kind of different group of uh, sites that have different similarities and differences to, um, to Lacey Point. And I wanted to look at um, how the artifact assemblages compare to these sites. What does Lacey Point resemble most closely to? of uh, these three other sites. So I put in, um, yeah, over 300 sampling units across the sites. Um, I did nearly a thousand individual sherds um, to understand, to compare Lacey Point to these other sites to see which, it close, which type of site it most closely resembled, or if it really truly does seem to be uh, in a league of its own. Um, this is just a small sampling of the ceramic types of ceramics that are at Lacey Point. Um, really beautiful polychromes and black and white um, bowls and uh, uh, jars. Um, very, very striking. The majority of it, though, is uh, grayware, uh, mostly corrugated jars, um, which I would find out is pretty much uh, what you get at pretty much every site, petrified forest. That is the norm. Um, so, yeah, mostly utilitarian wares, but a really uh, um, some really striking uh, vessels as well. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be flying through some charts here, um, just kind of going over the results. But um, yeah, my study after looking at ID nearly that thousand shirts, all those uh, sampling units. Um, yeah, Lacey Point definitely does uh, stand out for this the sheer density quantity of artifacts um, compared to the other sites, none of them are even really close um, for sure, uh, just density per square meter of uh, number of shirts that you find. Um, so yeah, Lacey Point definitely uh, has more uh, artifacts on it, uh, more uh, ceramics on it than uh, the, any of the other sites. Um, as far as vessel forms, um, that really didn't uh, re reveal anything unusual as far as, uh, yeah, jars are the, the most common, followed by bowls. Some, a few ladles and shaped sherds, and some kind of indeterminates. But um, yeah, overall, all the sites have pretty fairly similar ratios. Um, it's, it's jars. So nothing, they all seem to be pretty common or pretty similar there. Nothing uh, too revealing. Um, same with uh, wear ratios. Like I said, it's grayware jars. Um, 
across the board on all four sites. Doesn't matter if you're field house, domestics, uh, Pueblo, or Lacey Point. Uh, it's a whole lot of jars, which is not that that surprising. Um, but um, where things uh, start to uh, look uh, a bit interesting, looking at the origins of um, where white wares are coming from, uh, Lacey Point is a pretty balanced um, ratio. Yeah, little Colorado wares are um, the most common, but Cibola and Tucson, even a tiny bit of Zuni is also there. Um, so yeah, it's, it's pretty evenly split. That's not the case at any of the other sites. Um, some of the sites like 551, 575 didn't have any Tucson wares and seemed to have a very clear preference for um, particular uh, gain their wares from particular regions or tr different traditions versus Lacey Point seems to have um, a bit of everything. It's, um, it's representative for the larger um, ceramic tradition, larger ceramic traditions that are found in the petrified forest region. Um, whereas kind of other uh, households seem to favor one region over the other. Lacey Point has everything. Um, seems to be, be the most diverse of the sites. And then, um, yeah, as another point where Lacey Point um, uh, stands out is just the sheer uh, variety of ceramic types. So this is specific ceramic types um, from uh, each of the different uh, wares. And yeah, as you can see at Lacey Point at the bottom, particularly with the white wares, um, at least 15 different types were represented. Um, none of the other sites are even close. So Lacey Point has uh, the most dense density of uh, highest density of ceramics, and it has uh, the most ceramic uh, type types that are um, present. So it's the most diverse and the densest compared to any of the other sites. So it uh, really does seem to stand out. Um, in those respects from the other sites and not neatly fit into um, into any of um, any of the bot types, like site types that we might uh, put on the, um, try and put it into. It's not really looking like a domestic Pueblo, um, but it's not looking like a field house either. Um, some of the other, well, I was focusing on typing ceramics. Uh, some other interesting finds I've just, uh, uh, noted while doing my uh, this project. Um, there's abundant brownstone on the site. Um, I think over uh, 20 monos of matates, which again, small, like two to three room structure. That's a really high ratio, um, especially when looking at these large uh, Pueblo room blocks. Um, I'd maybe only find, you know, in the 10 plus room uh, Pueblo, like found at uh, the two Pueblo room block sites that were I used in this study. Um, they have only maybe a few monos matates. Lacey Point has over 20. So again, this weird uh, discrepancy between structure size and artifact, um, just sheer volume of the assemblage. Um, another find I found was a cupule slab. This hadn't been previously reported on. It's not a very big cupule slab. It only has a few um, cupules in it, plus um, some rubbing marks. But this is located at the entrance to the site. And for those who may not uh, be familiar, cupules, which are these, these little rock divots, don't seem to have a clear funk, like I guess what we'd, at least to a Western audience, say is utilitarian function. Uh, they're not like a mortar. Uh, they're too shallow. And often they're at an angle that wouldn't be conducive for that. Uh, but they tend to be found at sites that are more for a ceremonial or a pilgrimage, um, some function more than just a domestic day-to-day -day life. Um, so yeah, that was interesting. And that is located at the entrance to the site. Again, there's only one, really one way in, one way out. And similarly, I found these uh, interesting grinding slicks um, at the site. Uh, again, uh, these have, a, I think, not a standard utilitarian, uh, like, uh, uh, that you use like a matate for a uh, function for grinding food or other substances. Um, they're all concentrated around the mother game panel. And uh, the one on the, the, the right 
Um, this is on a vertical boulder face. Uh, so you couldn't even, if you wanted to grind up something, uh, it, it would just fall down. So I found maybe a half dozen of these. They're all at very steep angles. And yeah, none of them are very heavily used, but they are all used. And they're all concentrated around uh, the uh, petroglyph boulders. Um, so again, something that we find at um, pilgrimage sites, sites that um, have some significance where people were um, um, grinding these slicks, maybe not so much grinding the substance, more the act of grinding the slick itself was important to uh, whatever activities needed to happen uh, in this, this space. Um, found some other artifacts uh, that were note, uh, lots of polishing stones, which uh, are often used in uh, pottery production, which we have a lot of uh, ceramics on the site. Um, and uh, lots, lots of polishing stones, which seem to indicate maybe ceramics were made at this site. Uh, in addition, I didn't find any formal uh, jewelry at the site or anything like that, but did find one piece of raw turquoise. Um, and I forgot to mention um, earlier with uh, looking at the ground stone, um, I, the only food remains I found the site were some burnt fallen remains, but I did find quite a bit in the midden um, where the lar largest concentration of the uh, Sherds and the lithic debitage where did find some burnt fauna remains. I'm not a zoo archaeologist, but um, the only ammo I was able to identify was rabbit. But um, it looked like standard uh, trash that you'd find or household refuse um, you find in a uh, dwelling in petrified forest. Um, so, yeah, uh, seems like food production uh, consumption was happening um, on the site. Um, so, what are some uh, takeaways? Um, yeah, Lacey Point definitely has uh, um, a higher concentration of ceramics uh, than we found at any of the other sites in the area. It definitely does seem to stand out for just the sheer volume of ceramics as a more diverse ceramic assemblage than any of the other sites. Um, again, standing out from any of the others and as evidence of food preparation. Um, so we do know people were at least preparing, consuming food um, in this space. Um, another interesting little tidbit, that kind of side effect that came out of this with dating the ceramics. Um, traditionally, the site's been dated to primarily P2 to P3, which it still is, but I did find some wares which uh, pushed it, its date range into late P1 and a bit into P4. We did have some Hopi yellow wares on the site, which were not found at any of the other sites, um, which are dated to um, most likely the 1300s. Uh, so yeah, site uh, has a broader date range than the, any of the other sites in the area too, but still primarily P2, P3, contemporary with the other sites in this study. Um, so yeah, the assemblage is interesting. It most clearly resembles a domestic midden um, with this household trash, with food remains, household tools. Uh, again, it's not like there was an uh, certain number of fancy serving bowls at the site. Um, it's mostly utilitarian jars. If we saw, if I found this assemblage at um, you know, really large uh, uh, Pueblo room block uh, settlement, I, I wouldn't blink an eye at it. Uh, what makes it so odd is it's associated with just this tiny little structure out on this isolated butte. Um, so yeah, the assemblage does look like a domestic uh, Pueblo. Um, but the architecture is that of like a small field house and the location is uh, on this little butte overlooking, having a very expansive view of the Pan Desert with this petroglyph concentration with this um, very uh, distinct uh, kind of dual themes associated with it, um, which all are indicative of shrine sites or uh, pilgrimage sites. Um, but the, again, the artifact assemblage suggests a uh, habitation. So where's this leave us? Lacey Point really doesn't fit into any neat boxes. I do think it was a site of uh, either pilgrimage or um, uh, some sort of um, significance um, for the uh, surrounding population. But um, the assemblage on the site does seem to be more of a domestic assemblage. It's just, uh, it's huge um, for, a site this size. 
Um, so yeah, this Lacey Point is an example of a site that's uh, ingrained into local traditions. The rock art is using local iconography and uh, very much built into um, in relationship with these surrounding sites um, and seems to represent local um, ancestral Pueblo traditions of the petrified forest region. Um, that stands in contrast to Maxstad, our second stop in petrified forest. So Maxstad is located in a different area of the park, but it's still within the park. Um, and uh, yeah, it's one of the, it's really the only site that um, only great house contender within the current park boundaries. Um, there is one other site um, called McCreary Pueblo, which has a great kiva, which was, has been excavated and was thought for some time, like, oh, this could be another potential outlier of Chaco. Uh, there wasn't seeming to, once it was excavated, it didn't really seem to resemble uh, a Chaco and great kiva and seems to more represent uh, uh, great kiva traditions that are found more on the Mogollon Rim. So, excuse me. Um, yeah, Mercury Pueblo, that was thought for a while to be a possible Chaco one contender. Not so much anymore. Again, that's a site that seems to be in, um, involved more with some more local um, or Mogollon influenced uh, traditions. Maxstad, though, um, has uh, some of the hallmarks of a Chaco one site. And uh, while I was at Lacey Point, I had compared uh, ceramics to other sites. At Maxstad, I had compared um, uh, petroglyphs at Max around Max side to um, other sites within the park and sites within Chaco Canyon um, to discern if when you take a non-local architectural tradition and drop it in the petrified forest region, how does that disrupt iconographic traditions? How does that disrupt or not disrupt um, petroglyph traditions um, and in the petrified forest, which has such a um, strong and unique um, petroglyph tradition. I don't know if I emphasized that enough earlier on. Uh, Petrified Forest has uh, one of the highest concentrations of petroglyphs of anywhere in the uh, in the U.S. and uh, definitely does have some elements in it that are um, kind of diagnostic or um, hallmarks of the the rock art of the greater little Colorado region. Um, so I will not go down a Chaco rabbit hole. I'm too busy with that writing my dissertation, but a 30 second Chaco overview in case anyone isn't familiar with Chaco. Um, Chaco Canyon is located in Northwestern New Mexico. Um, beginning in the AD 800s, there began uh, the uh, construction of large monumental architecture called great houses that became uh, eventually accompanied by other features such as great kivas, um, roads, shrine systems, um, along with the importation of exotic goods from uh, Northern Mexico uh, and uh, Gulf of California, Pacific Ocean for shells. Um, I don't know why I keep jumping ahead of me. Um, but yeah, Chaco Canyon, one of the most studied areas um, archeologically uh, in North America, but um, yeah, Chaco's uh, influence seems to have spread across much of the northern Southwest um, in the form of um, what are called outlier communities, which have great houses, essentially miniature, sometimes not so miniature versions of the structures found in Chaco, um, with the petrified forest region being on the very kind of western periphery of where you can find great houses. And I will say Chaco does have a very, very abundant um, uh, concentration of petroglyphs and pictographs. Um, they're often overlooked in um, the archaeology of Chaco Canyon, um, but they are there and they are very abundant. Um, they're just not as uh, dramatic or stylistically distinct as other areas in the Southwest. Um, but returning to Max Stad, um, it's built between circa 1050 to 1100. It's never been formally excavated. Um, and that's had some pre preliminary mapping and site descriptions done by Dennis Gilpin. Um, 
I've been through it a few times. It's, uh, it's really impressive. It's located on top of this little uh, conical butte, um, kind of completely isolated, tiny little butte located between two larger uh, surrounding mesas. So you kind of funneled into the site um, from either the north or the south um, to this little butte, and there it is. So it's um, elevated above the landscape, um, but also kind of like Lacey Point, restricted access to it. You can only kind of approach from two ways um, to it. And um, why do we think this is a great house? Well, it has core and veneer masonry. No other structures within the park have architecture like this. It's got large rooms, well, very well uh, made uh, masonry. And um, there are other great houses in the area, particularly uh, there's Navajo Springs and uh, the Canyon Butte site. Um, so it's not completely isolated. There are other uh, potential great houses. It's small. It's only, I think, seven-ish rooms. So if you, put, if you put this in Chaco Canyon, you wouldn't blink an eye at it. But it's, you put it in Petrified Forest, and it sticks out like a, a sore thumb. Um, so yeah, goals. I kind of run over some of this already. Um, rock art at Chaco is uh, often... Uh, overlooked or not to really incorporate into the official narrative of Chaco with some exceptions. Um, so yeah, it's largely underreported. And this is even more so at uh, outlier great house sites. To be fair, a lot of outliers, there isn't uh, good rock faces to make petroglyphs or pictographs, but um, and others, it just hasn't really been investigated. So this was an opportunity to look at where our, what our petroglyphs are other petroglyphs around Max died, where are they depicting, and then how does planting this non-local architecture, this non-local structure um, in this landscape, how does that affect the iconography? Um, yeah, so would if this potential bastion of Chacoan influence, would it disrupt um, the local iconography? Uh, or would the iconography completely stay the same? Um, or would there really uh, be, would there be a mixture of both? Um, so to determine uh, how Max Stad's uh, rock art assemblage compared to Chaco and other uh, sites within the, um, uh, the park, um, I looked at uh, uh, three other sites um, in addition to Max Stad, um, Petroglyph Canyon, which uh, is located in a different area of the park, but has a really high concentration of petroglyphs um, and uh, very much imagery that's indicative hallmarks of local petrified forest um, traditions, or I should say little Colorado traditions. Um, so a good representative site for like what typical rock art um, in the park is. And that was done by, um, the data I used was collected by John Pitts in 2019. And uh, his work also supplemented um, uh, data I had collected myself for Max Stott. Uh, for Pueblo Benito and Petroglyph uh, Trail, these are sites within Chaco Canyon, Pueblo Benito, the oldest and largest great house, Petroglyph Trail um, along the canyon wall nearby. Um, that was data was collected by Barbara Bain in 2008 uh, for her master's thesis. So I'm grateful to all the people that collected this data and I'm very happy to be putting it into use now. Um, so yeah, those are the sites. And uh, yeah, just some little preliminary numbers um, showing the number of panels and just individual elements that were uh, uh, documented at each of these sites. Um, Pueblo Benio is interesting, um, whereas a huge number of the um, uh, elements at the site consist of sharpening grooves. Uh, needless to say, none of the other sites um, that were in this study had nearly that many number of uh, sharpening groups. That seems to be something very distinct to um, Pueblo Benito, which again, going back to Lacey Point, talking about those cupules and grinding slicks, um, seems to be something um, found uh, with these uh, significant sites. And um, yeah, so Pueblo Benito definitely stands apart in that regard. So um, yeah, that's just uh, something different about Pueblo Benito. But um, getting into um, the actual analysis, um, looking at geometrics, 
across the four sites. Again, our, um, overall, nothing really too much stands out, um, except for one very interesting thing being uh, spirals here, which are, uh, I'm sure many of you know, are very much associated at Chaco, not something distinct to Chaco. Spirals are found all across the Southwest and beyond, but we all know about the uh, uh, Sun Dagger Solstice Marker on Fajada Butte in um, Chaco Canyon. And um, previous rock art researchers at Chaco do seem to indicate there is a higher concentration of uh, spirals at Chaco Canyon, potentially. And uh, we might see that play out here where we see the percentage ratio of spirals um, uh, at the Chaco Canyon sites dwarfs what's found at Petroglyph Canyon. And not uh, max size, not quite as high as these, but it's still much, much higher than found at Petroglyph Canyon where spirals are not that common. Spirals are found in Petrified Forest, but um, there seems to be a, a break here with max size seeming to have a much higher ratio of spirals, which may or may not correlate with um, the rock art traditions uh, practice at Chaco. Um, here's just uh, some of the uh, examples of spirals at uh, Max Dodd. I like this one in particular, uh, connecting to this pair of feet, which we'll be talking about feet and sandals more in just a second. Um, kind of on the flip side, um, with uh, zoomorphs or dendromorphs, this is uh, depictions of animals and plants. Um, Two things kind of stand out to stood out to me. Max Dodd has a ton of depictions of snakes. I don't know what that's about, um, but yeah, for whatever reason, the rock art around Max Dodd very high ratio of uh, snake depictions. I really have no idea what to make of that. But um, if you look at uh, felines over here, specifically depictions of mountain lions, that is something that um, is pretty uh, not uncommon in the rock art of uh, Petrified Forest. Um, in fact, uh, if you go to the Pan Desert Inn, um, there's a large petroglyph slab there with a, um, I mean, it's a huge depiction of a, a mountain lion, stylized depiction of a mountain lion. Um, yeah, mountain lions are pretty common in the Little Colorado region and the rock art are found at Chaco, but not super common. Um, yeah, not every panel, in Petrified Forest says mountain lions, but they are pretty common. And interestingly, around Max Dodd, there are none, which does seem to correlate with uh, what you would see in um, see in uh, Chaco Canyon. Also, Petr fun fact, Petrified Forest does have depictions of bats. They're not very common, but um, they're really cool. There's uh, one at, Petrif um, one at uh, Petroglyph Canyon. There's some not too far from uh, Max Dodd, um, a good distance away, but uh, not too far. So uh, bats are found on the petrified forest landscape. Uh, they're really cool, um, kind of a unique aspect to the petrified um, rock art, petrified forest. Um, just a couple depictions of, here's one of the snakes. Here's uh, some sort of quadruped. Um, yeah, not a ton of depictions of deer or antelope, but some. Um, anthromorphs, I, um, not too much uh, distinct for Max Todd or really any of the other sites. Um, yeah, if anything, Max Todd seems to have a lower ratio of um, anthromorphs depictions of, uh, of people. I will say though, <coughs> while um, its ratio of female figures is lower, the female figures it does have are very prominently placed. Um, if this figure in particular um, is about, you know, yay tall and very prominently placed on boulder. And uh, this interior design work here, uh, I don't know if that's maybe depicting a rib cage. I have, have no idea, but um, figures like with this very intricate interior designs are uh, found not uncommonly in the petrified forest region. And this is something that you just do not find, at least not that often at, at Chaco figures with this intricate um, of design, of uh, interior design work. Um, so another kind of just surprise um, that again, just kind of 
making things always more complicated because of course things are more complicated. Uh, were these uh, duck or bird headed figures? Um, these are way more common uh, further up north in the upper San Juan region or up in uh, Canyon de Chez. Um, they're occasionally found in petrified forest, but this is pretty much at the southern periphery of where you get them. And I was really surprised to find them, um, to find three nonetheless, uh, no less uh, around Maxstad. And uh, this, these figures are more associated with uh, Cayenta uh, populations. Um, so really unusual. Um, and uh, perhaps showing that um, reg the regional influences here aren't just restricted to Chaco, that maybe there's some Cayenta influence here too. Um, complete side note, there's a whole line of these weird three-footed tracks. I have no idea. And I found these other places in Petrified Forest. I'm not sure what type of critter or person they're supposed to belong to, but uh, I found in a couple of different places in the park and the, uh, if, if anyone has seen footprints like this, other places in the Southwest, it always just struck me as unusual. Um, another aspect of, um, I know I'm running out of time here, but I'll uh, fly through these. Um, objects, depictions of people holding objects or objects themselves are another hallmark of petrified forest um, rock art. Um, and uh, as you can see with uh, Petroglyph Canyon, these uh, objects are pretty depicted pretty uh, often and uh, not so much with the Chacoan sites or Max Dodd. Um, but there was one very distinct one. This slab Pajo was found pretty near the Max Dodd Gray House. And uh, this is a, a ceremonial object um, that um, is found uh, repeatedly in uh, um, panels of the petrified forest and um, not at least this clearly depicted in um, rock art at Chaco Canyon. Um, so this is a very much a local, a localized image lo coming from the local tradition, which is found seemingly in association with this non-local architecture. Um, similar with these staff, staff bearers, um, which all seem to have these horns. These are all found kind of lining the route to uh, the great house and uh, figures holding big staves, or um, this one's unusual holding a spiral. Um, these are found throughout the petrified forest region. These aren't unusual on themselves, but finding this concentration of them and lining the route to the site, um, I found pretty interesting. Um, again, textile uh, objects, depiction of objects aren't as common at Maxstad as other sites in petrified forest, but um, this is most likely a textile uh, blanket or some other textile. And uh, depictions of textiles are another common feature of uh, um, rock art in the little Colorado region. Um, so yeah, you are getting, it's not as high of a ratio um, as you get maybe in other sites in Petrified Forest, but you do get these local traditions seemingly still happening um, along with uh, depictions of figures holding dance wands, crook neck staffs, which are uh, certainly known at Chaco, uh, physical examples are known at Chaco, but um, uh, are found uh, depicted in rock art throughout the Southwest. Um, so I, I don't think the inclusion of these um, is just a clear sign of Chacoan influence, but uh, they are here around uh, the next uh, gray house. Um, and perhaps most interestingly are these uh, depictions of feet, which are even way higher than um, found even at Chaco, and uh, much higher than found at Petroglyph Canyon. <laughs> particularly uh, these uh, feet, feet and this hand showing polydactyly, which is uh, when you have more than your standard five digits. Um, we know um, polydactyly was uh, a condition that was present at Chaco, particularly it seems maybe with uh, elites or uh, a founding family at Chaco. Um, it's depicted um, in rock art at Chaco and objects at Chaco and then um, both physical remains and in the plaster of Pueblo Benito, there's footprints of people with uh, uh, polydactyly. So we know it's at Chaco and it's theorized that um, this form of sandal called a jog toed sandal um, is uh, associated with polydactyly at Chaco. Um, ben Balarado did uh, his dissertation on this and I highly recommend anyone to read more into his research, but uh, finding that uh, this form of sandal eventually 
became associated um, perhaps with Chaco is found with spread this depictions of these sandals and the sand this sandal form itself um, spread across the northern and southwest. And as far as I know, these are the only depictions of jog toed sandals found in Petrified Forest National Park. And it seems pretty telling. Where do you find them? At a great house. Um, again, they're pretty simple, but they're they're there. They're uh, found uh, right on the approach to, to Max Dodd. So where does that leave us? Is Max Dodd disrupting local rock art traditions? Is it a bastion of Chaco and influence or people emulating Chaco? Well, we have a lot of feed imagery, which seems to be tied, uh, which seems to be a theme at Chaco, especially with polydactyly and dog toe sandals and a higher ratio of uh, spirals. But at the same time, um, we have a depiction of a slab pajo, figures with stabs and dance wands, you know, objects, which is uh, associated more with uh, local petrified forest traditions. Um, and again, figures with elaborate interior designs, which you just don't typically find at Chaco. So it seems to be um, to return to both our sites. Um, petrified forest is a crossroads. It's where multiple traditions are seemingly coexisting or um, at least uh, tolerating each other or intermixing, um, where you have this Chaco and Great House, which seems to be introducing some new imagery into local rock art traditions. But those rock art traditions aren't just ending at Chaco, they're still continuing. And uh, uh, I should say at Max Dog, there's uh, hardly any artifacts at all. Um, and I'm sure some of that could be due to looting over the years, but uh, uh, it's still night and day to compare to Lacey Point where, so really there's two, these two similar sites found uh, top these prominent places on the landscape, overlooking the landscape, but it's uh, the practices performed there uh, couldn't be more different. Um, Max, uh, Lacey Point seems to be enmeshed in local traditions and be, uh, had something involved where uh, large refuse deposits were made, but has this very tiny little structure up uh, top of the butte uh, versus Max Dye, which has this very prominent, well-built, large structure built um, atop this conical hill um, and introducing new imagery into local rock art traditions, but not stopping those rock art traditions, but having a very light artifact scattered. Not much refuse was produced at Max Dodd. Um, so yeah, Petrified Forest, it sits on ideological crossroads of different traditions. We see that just alone in the ceramics, um, which uh, has uh, Cibola, Tucson, and Little Colorado, where it's all kind of converging these different traditions uh, meeting, which can be seen as a proxy for different uh, groups of people merging, interacting in this kind of border zone of a landscape. Um, so there are two different sites, but um, I think representing two different uh, forms of salient space um, within the same landscape. Uh, just thank you to the staff at uh, Petrified Forest National Park. They do a stellar job. Um, and Petrified Forest is uh, seemingly to always be expanding. So I'm excited for what uh, changes and growth is happening at Petrified Forest. Thank you to Arkin Hiss, my advisor, Dr. Ruth Van Dyke, and uh, my wife, Lizzie, and the rest of my family for uh, all their patience and support. And um, I don't think I went too much over time. I'm happy to take questions. Um, I know there was a lot, but um, I'm happy to uh, answer any questions people have. All right, Max, that was very interesting. And um, you're getting some hand clapping and thumbs up going across the screen. I don't know if you see those. Um, uh, nice. Getting some love out there. That's great. Um, we do have some questions. And um, first, there were a couple of questions about uh, those grinding slicks at Lacey Point. Mm -hmm. So could they be uh, for honing tools was one question. And did you test them for sound? Since it's a, a shrine-like site, did you test them for bell rock sounds? I'm, I'm kicking myself that I didn't test them. As far as I know, um, there aren't any known bell rocks within um, Petrified Forest. And I, I have seen some bell rocks, and um, they didn't have the 
wear marks that at least I'm familiar with bell mm -hmm. rock being struck. These were mm -hmm. very heavily ground, um, very just light slicks. Uh, they've never been, at least as far as I could find, ever been noticed or recorded before. Um, you, you really don't notice them until, unless you feel them, um, just feel this uh, smoothed out area on the rock. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, it, I could see they, um, they could, could be tool sharpening marks. Um, I've, I've seen tool sharpening marks on other sites um, and they didn't, they are, certainly aren't the like deep grooves right. that you find um, associated with like uh, uh, axe sharpening um, features. Um, yeah, I, I'm a bit perplexed by them. Um, I could certainly see tool sharpening. If they were tool sharpening, they weren't used much. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, they, they are seeming to concentrate around uh, these petroglyphs. They aren't found on any of the other boulders throughout the site, just around uh, the petroglyphs. Okay. Okay. I have quite a few more questions, so we'll just move on. How about water sources near any of the sites? Yeah, that's a, a great question. So uh, the nearest water source really for all the sites is um, the lithodendron wash, which only has running surface running water in it essentially during the monsoon season um, and even sparing during then. Hope, I mean, I've uh, been more reliable in the past, um, but certainly you could probably dig for water um, need, if need be. There aren't any, uh, at least springs I'm aware of, or certainly no springs um, running now in the area. So all of these sites around Lacey Point would have uh, um, been using the lithodendron wash probably as the nearest water source. Um, I will say around Lacey Point, there's no good arable land. Um, it, not any real good farm land around uh, Lacey Point. So that's another aspect. They weren't coming here to Lacey Point. It's not like a field house next to a good arable area. Um, it's pretty, uh, it's, it's bad lands. It's, it's pretty uh, rocky. Okay. Um, how about, um... Couple, could the artifact richness be the result of the erosive environment at Lacey Point as compared to the more windblown sands you find on the other uh, petrified forest mesa tops? Um, yeah, and that is definitely, I think, um, could be a, a, is a contributing factor. Um, the mesa top site I did um, choose for, especially the large uh, Pueblo room block, is actually right on the edge of the mesa top. So part of it is in that more sand blown area, but where I put most of my units is the Pueblo essentially is unfortunately falling off into the Payan Desert. Mm -hmm. um, so it, most of that site in particular is the uh, pre-exposed badlands, similar to what is found at um, Petrify, uh, found at Lacey Point. Um, the little field house site um, is more in that sand blown environment. So I am sure that uh, if uh, it were more in the badland environment, more would be exposed. Um, the other site is um, the Pueblo that's located within the um, within the more painted desert is also in a more uh, badland environment. So um, yeah, I think part of it for sure is uh, Lacey Point uh, is more exposed, does have more erosion. Um, but the other uh, two uh, large Pueblos have a similar uh, environment as well mm -hmm. and um, even with that more exposure from erosion aren't producing the uh, assemblage size found at uh, at Lacey Point. Okay um, so how about does the paucity of the artifacts at Max Dodd suggest that maybe it was a structure for monumental effect but not for residence or ceremony? Um I definitely don't think people were living. I mean, I, if people were living at Max Dodd, it definitely was a very short span, or they were not uh, certainly doing a lot of domestic activities at Max Dodd. Um, I think it definitely was built for monumental effect. It's not on a convenient space. It's not like easy to get up on top of this little bad lamp conical butte um, for either site, but especially Max Dodd. Um, yeah, I think it absolutely was built to be seen um, um, as you're approaching it from kind of funneled towards it, uh, either from the north or the south. Um, 
yeah, I still think Sarah, if Sarah Moy did take place this there, um, it, it was just different than say what may have happened at Lacey Point, where uh, it's not like say at Pueblo Alto, where um, you no, know, it's been theorized uh, or debated um, mm -hmm. that uh, people were coming in having feasting events and making these large trash mounds. That certainly did not happen at Max Dodd. Um, but I still think people probably were doing something here. Uh, certainly it was built to be seen by people um, mm -hmm. on the landscape. Okay, um, um, with, on that same line, um, it's hard to tell from the image of the top of the Lacey Point Hill, but is that structure found there similar to the ceremonial site on the, on the mesa top above Petroglyph Canyon? Does do they uh, look similar? That, um, that, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm not too familiar with the Petroglyph Canyon um, site, um, at least in that regards, um, beyond the Petroglyphs at it. Um, I think what's found at, um, there is pretty simple in form. Um, but yeah, uh, I think Lacey Point is, uh, it's not resembling what's found at most, uh, what are classically defined as shrine sites, which is often just a pretty simple stone structure. This has, if we found this anywhere else in the park, it'd, it'd be like, oh yeah, it's a little hakal, like small domicile or a field house. Um, it, uh, yeah, it doesn't look like what you would typically, at least I'm aware of, find with sites associated with shrines. It, it looks like a tiny little field house or tiny domestic mm -hmm. structure, mm -hmm. which the mid midden seems to reflect too. Yeah, that it um, that, that goes right into another question. Uh, someone suggesting, could Lacey Point be a site for individual meditation of some type or just for a, sp a few small, you know, few individuals? that are hanging out there, I guess. Um, I, I honestly think that's most likely scenario. Um, again, I'm not really going to go into, uh, I just don't know the, what type of act, like specific activities um, related to ceremony or pilgrimage happened there. I think that's uh, the job to collaborate with the Senate communities um, mm -hmm. to discuss. Um, but yeah, I do think um, if there was some sort of significance at Lacey Point. It was uh, a few individuals staying there. Um, it has been theorized in the past that uh, Lacey Point could have been a sun watching station. I, did, I didn't I did put this in my PowerPoint. I did um, go out. Um, it was a very cloudy day, but I went out um, on the summer solstice, so I couldn't see if that uh, spiral had any um, uh, like solar calendar properties, but people in the past have looked at that and said it doesn't. But I did um, look at um, using an application on my phone, look at where um, the sun was going to rise and set on both solstices and both equinoxes, and it doesn't seem to rise or set to any prominent land form that I could identify on the horizon. It does have a very impressive view shed from Lacey Point. Um, to multiple prominent formations um, in the Payant Desert, but uh, none that seemed to, at least through I, what I could track, uh, would have correlated with uh, sunrise or sunsets during one of the major uh, solar events. Okay. Um, how about any interpretation of the sites by Native Americans that you're aware of? Uh, not that I'm aware of other than uh, talking about, again, the mother of game panel. Um, uh, Eckhart uh, Malachi has done a lot of uh, work along with them. Kelly Hayes Gilpin has also talked about uh, Lacey Point um, in regards to the mother of game figure. Um, um, yeah, I, I know I have uh, spoken with, uh, I briefly described the site to um, uh, some descendant community members and they do seem very interested in it. I won't uh, go into the details over what uh, um, they thought it was, um, but it it does. Uh, there is interest in the few individuals I have talked to. Great. Uh, how about any casino casino masks at the two sites? Um, that's a great question. Um, so there is a, a pretty uh, strong Pueblo four period. Um, uh, petroglyph tradition at um, Petrified Forest, but it's really concentrated in just a few areas during the Pueblo Four, which is we're talking mostly 1300s here at PFO. Um, 
the population kind of constricts into just a few settlements. Perico Pueblo is the one that the public can visit. It's a very uh, nicely interpreted and uh, uh, accessible. Um, that has some casino masks at it. And there are a few other places in the park where you do get images of casinas. Um, there is one depiction of a possible casino mask in a couple drainages away from Lacey Point. Um, it's just one isolated one though, and there's nothing at Lacey Point and nothing around Max Dodd that looks even remotely Pueblo Four, at least that I could, that I would feel safe identifying. Um, and yeah, no Pueblo Four ceramics at um, around Max Dodd, and just a smattering, like I could fit in the palm of my hand the number of uh, P Four ceramics I identified at Lacey Point. There were some though. I mentioned that there were some Hopi yellow wares. So the site's still being at least visited and used at least into the 1300s, so maybe a bit later, but uh, uh, not nearly to the uh, intensity that it was previously. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to go back to the idea of, the, of Lacey Point being a shrine for a second. Um, any examples of shrine keepers? as in those living there and taking care of the area, the site, even producing pottery there for ritual uses and that sort of thing at Lacey Point. I mean, again, I think um, that is where I am leaning towards what Lacey Point is. Um, again, it's not looking um, just structurally, it's not like a ton of people really could have lived there, um, but, and it's not, uh, the fact that there's so many polishing stones, yeah, it seems to indicate that like a lot of, it doesn't look like a domestic site, but you gain a lot of domestic trash at it. Um, including these polishing stones indicating pottery production was happening. I didn't talk about maybe enough, and there's a whole other study really, but there's so much lithic debitage there. And it's not, there's no good lithic sources right at Lacey Point. So again, that's another thing to rule out. It's not like they're coming here to do, um, no, there's not a good petrified wood source right at Lacey Point. They're bringing in material and working on it there. Um, so yeah, it's, it's stuff you would find at a, a domestic site. But um, yeah, I, I do think there were a few small group of individuals maybe that lived there or or that um, maybe a few times a year, I, I, you know, at some routine basis, people came there and did do these uh, more domestic activities there even if they weren't living there year round. Because um, uh, other than like, really the only thing that could really is draws people, I would say draw people to a lacy point is the view shed. It has really impressive view shed and it's prominent. It really stands out on the landscape. Other than that, it doesn't have good water. It's not arable land. It doesn't have any good lithic material to, to procure there. Um, it's, I think people are drawn there for our the view shed and its prominence on the landscape. All right, just a couple of, um, any evidence of Chaco and Rhodes? Not that area? I'm aware of at all. Um, doesn't mean they couldn't be there. I mean, there could be one at Max Dodd and I walked right over it. Um, <laughs> so they can be notoriously uh, difficult to, to, to see, especially if you're on the ground. Um, I, as far as I know, though, no, there's there's uh, no major road segments at the very least um, in the area of Petrified Forest. Okay. And um, can you talk a little bit, um, you mentioned the petroglyphs of the bats. Could you elaborate a little bit more on those? Um, yeah. So um, I don't know if I've actually seen the ones at uh, Petroglyph Canyon. Um, I know of at least two other places in the park, though, where you find them. And um, the one that's, uh, it's not at Max Dodd, the, the surrounding Mesa, but it's not too far from Max Dodd. There's, uh, it's really interesting. Um, you get a, a boulder slab leaned up against another, creating this tiny little kind of crawl space between them. And you crawl in there and you look up and it's covered in petroglyphs. And within this small, dark space, you find depictions of bats. So it's like a space where bats would live, you get depictions of bats, um, um, which is pretty cool. Um, but yeah, I mean, you look at it, it's like, oh yeah, that's a bat. It's got the little ears and webbed wings. Um, yeah, they're, they're really fun. But uh, yeah, uh, 
they're uh, kind of a unique little gem in within the petrified forest uh, petroglyphs tradition. And I'll quick uh, add, I know um, I mostly talked about petroglyphs. Yeah, uh, for some reason or another, pictographs are not really found at petrified forest at all. Um, there's plenty of uh, bold overhangs where they can make them, but uh, they're just not um, really found uh, hardly at all in, in petrified forests or their surrounding mm -hmm. landscape. But uh, petro petroglyphs are uh, abundant. Mm -hmm. All right, how about this? Do you think that the jitterbug panel site is similar to Lacey Point? Um, habitation, ceremonial site, pottery types, et cetera. Um, yeah, so that's a point, or that's a site that's on kind of the same transitional zone between the Mesa top um, and down into the proper desert, painted desert proper, the valley floor. Um, I've been to that site a few times. It's, it's much smaller, at least that I understand, um, than Petrified Forest, or I'm sorry, than Lacey Point. Um, I don't remember what that panel even looks like or what all the imagery is. Um, I wouldn't be surprised. Um, I mean, there are multiple petroglyph panels found throughout kind of that area of the painted desert. Um, Lacey Point definitely has a very distinct concentration of them, but it's not the only place to find petroglyphs in that portion of the park. Um, yeah, I would not be surprised if, uh, I mean, we know ethnographically and uh, archaeologically, um, movement to kind of formalize movement processions um, were very uh, important to uh, ancestral Pueblo uh, populations. The, um, we see that chaco with the formalized roads. Um, but yeah, I, I don't, I would not be surprised if some of the other petroglyph panels played into uh, uh, kind of were stopping points or were uh, played into um, people approaching Lacey Point as you approach Lacey Point, again, only one way in and one way out. Um, you, depending on what direction you came from, you would pass these other sites, including uh, Jitterbug. So uh, Jitterbug, as far as I know, um, does not, I'm sure it has some artifacts, but does not have uh, um, any structures related uh, at it or any um, major uh, artifact assemblage that you find at Lacey Point. Okay, um, any other questions out there? If not, thank you, Max. Let's see, I've got a few comments about great presentation and, and thank you for, for sharing all this. It's so nice to see this deep dive into those sites and to see the similarities and the differences. So um, you will get a copy of all of the questions and the comments afterwards. And th those of you out there, thank you so much for joining us. We hope to see you January 23rd, starting at 6.30. We're starting a half hour earlier uh, for the, for the um, uh, winter event, the winter party and, and fundraiser and silent auction and all of that. So you'll hear more about that soon. And thank you so much, everyone. And uh, have a good evening and enjoy the holidays. <laughs>